expression within our own community of the way that we see different people uh, and the way that different qualities and traits are associated with masculinity and femininity. Um, and so we create hierarchies within hierarchies where there is the attainable, where there's the unattainable ideal of being the top, the straight, the, not the straight, the top who's so masculine and then there's the bottom. Which it never really made sense to me because I was like, it takes two to tango, so like, why are you making fun of me for being a bottom? Because like, that makes no sense because then you're not getting any and I'm not getting any. <laughs> so like, you're really just screwing yourself over, so like, have fun with your hand. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, so, and there are instances of reframing, kind of resisting these uh, stereotypes and these ideas within the gay community, the ideas of like the power bottom, and they do exist. So there are forms of resistance, and I'm not trying to like homogenize the whole community into top and bottom. There are verse, there are different ways of labeling yourself. Um, but I guess kind of the point of what my story is, is that the way that we read masculinity and femininity um, I was, is not only tied into sexual identity, but it's also still very much tied into the way that we read um, we read these norms off of people's bodies and the way that they present themselves and the social cues that we gather from what they say. And we make assumptions about those people based, we make assumptions of those people in their sexual lives based on what we know about them from the things that they tell us. So people who, ask, who assume that I'm a bottom have no idea about my sexual, what I do in the bedroom. They, they can ask and I'll tell them it doesn't matter. Um, but they make assumptions about it and that's, I think what we were all talking about here is how these ideas of masculinity and femininity come to shape people's perceptions of you and how you can be perceived to be in a relationship. And it's always my favorite question when I was dating a guy and they were like, so who's, so people would be like, so who's the man in the relationship or who's the girl? And I was like, uh, uh, like, boy, boy, like, <laughs> but what they're getting at is they're asking, okay, so who is the bottom and who is the top? Who is the dominant one and who is the submissive one? That's what they want to know and there's such an intense fascination with knowing the, this information, which is why we're here and we're so fascinated with learning about this, but, there, but it, I think it's because we learn, we react off of each other by knowing these cues. We know how to respond to the masculine person, we know how to respond to the feminine person, we know how to understand a relationship. We can't conceptualize a relationship of two masculine men. That doesn't really make sense within what Manya talked about, so we need to kind of categorize, be like, okay, so he's the bottom, so he's the girl, this is the top, he's the man, and then that reinforces this normative heterosexual relationship, even though there's two guys in it. But we're still so dependent on being like, guy, girl, two penises, doesn't matter. Uh, and I think that is such a pervasive idea um, and something that I just kind of wanted to bring up and I look forward to chatting with you guys about whatever you want to talk about. <coughs> Well, I guess let's open the floor to the audience. And uh, like, did you have something you wanted to add? Kind of a yeah, kind of a question. I'm kind of familiar how to ask this question to the panel. So I'm gonna just kind of go, and I'm gonna mess up the story. Am I? So uh, Abraham Morgenthaler wrote a book called Why Men Fake It, and he tells this story about uh, he he's a, he works in a men's health clinic in Boston, and he had this client come in who had erectile dysfunction, and uh, you know, I was like, Doc, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I can't please my partner, I can't get it up. I'm no longer a man. And uh, so they do the treatment and everything, right? A couple of months later, he comes back in the office and he's like, Doc, I'm a man again. I'm a man. I got it up. I cleansed my wife. Like, I'm a man. He has multiple sclerosis. And from the waist down, he has no feeling. So for him, it was about the performance. And so much of it is around, like, why guys do what they do. Because a lot of people are like, well, guys want to have sex. They want to get laid, the pleasure. Pleasure has, it's so hard to figure out how much this is actual pleasure. Like why we're actually doing what we're doing. Guys are so, it's the performance, like am I big enough? Am I good enough? Am I doing this good enough? Am I doing it right? And the fear of striking out, and the fear of vulnerability. Yeah, I don't think there's a question on all that, but <laughs> there's any comments on like all that gibberish there? Yeah, well, I, I, I like to just talk about sex is the end goal of life. Like, there's, I remember when, growing up in high school and even for it still, sometimes you ask the question, so would you rather, um, uh, would you rather uh, make it so your, your dick doesn't work anymore or you die? And guys would be like, oh, I, I'd die, <laughs> definitely. Because there's no life once you cannot have sex, because sex is the end goal. And this was like a legitimate kind of thought, um, like 
which is really weird. Um, but uh, but along with that is comes if you're if you're at school and you're not getting laid, um, you are losing. And despite the fact that we're at university to learn, we're at university to uh, ex explore everything and not just sex. And so sometimes people get so depressed and so down because they're losing in this one way, or they or they're so they care so much about this one thing because it, it's tied to that being a man and winning. Uh, yeah, and I also just want to, like, based on, like, um, he had erectile dysfunction, too, like, I just want to ask you guys, do you think the end goal of a sexual sort of activity with your partner, whoever it may be, is to orgasm? Put your hand up if you believe it is so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know what? I'm really surprised that there's few hands because... Traditionally, we would think that, you know, like, you love it, you, like, guys love coming, girls love orgasming, and that becomes the goal of the whole thing. And, like, I was talking in my talk, too, you know, with anyone even with sexual dysfunction, what about everything in between? What about the foreplay? What about the talk? What about the sexual tension? What about the lubrication? What about all of it, you know? And like, it just becomes a matter of like, especially with masculinity is, if you can't get it up, if you can't get that end goal, even as a, like, as a woman too, not having, like seeing my partner not doing that at first was really troubling because I thought that was what it was supposed to be. But it's only when you start to explore everything else, you realize, oh, well, I mean, that's great, too. That's another facet of, in my opinion, another facet of what it is. You know? um, yeah, I think kind of an interesting point on your story. Uh, I think part of something that we've been talking about, an underlying issue, is like the, commercial, the commercialization and the commodification of these um, two ideas that we're talking about. And we talk about masculinity and femininity in very kind of academic, kind of up here terms. But these are ideas that are bought and sold to us every day in everything that we do. Um, like, Fuck, we have Viagra, so guys can keep it up for years and years and years past when they're supposed to. Like there's, su there's, there are million dollar industries built around keeping guys within these ideas that this is what it means to be a guy. We are sold this every day, and the same with women. And you are sold what it means to be masculine, you're sold what you mean to be feminine. Um, but I think kind of something that your story also touches on uh, is how virginity is not associated with masculinity, which I think is kind of an underlying <laughs> issue, is that for, for women, it's like virginity is this thing that you, like, it's very much about, like, preserving it, keeping it, saving it for the right moment. And then for guys, it's like, man, you gotta drop that shit like it's hot. <laughs> like, damn. Like, I'm a 22-year-old virgin, and I still have people asking me, being like, I was dating a guy for a month, and they're like, wait, how did you not lose it yet? And I was like, I don't know, but it's like, there's this very interesting idea that like we like if you're like plus twenty like it's almost like it's a bad thing to be a virgin and it's mm -hmm. and then, and then, like everyone then assumes because you're a virgin you haven't done other things and I was like yo just because I haven't had sex doesn't mean I can't give you a great blowjob sorry <laughs> <laughs> being honest so I think there's an interesting idea that like virginity and sexual and your your sexual performance are very much tied up into masculinity and I think it builds into expectations around who you are and just conversations that guys have with each other about the, the women that they've been with or the men that they've been with is that it's a very big problem, I think. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel like, I mean, at, sorry, did I cut someone off? I'm oh, no, um, I'm not sure, if, well, I guess tying back to your, uh, your comment about erectile dysfunction, uh, I recently had a personal experience. I was on grad trip, so we were all like drinking a little bit. And I hooked up with this guy, and you, you were just so wasted, you couldn't get it up. And like, I was, I was like really chill about it. I was like, yeah, dude, like it's cool. Like if I were a guy and drank too much, it'd happen to me too. And he just flipped out. He was like, well, maybe if we weren't on the floor of your balcony, then this would have happened. Or, like, maybe if you're like, maybe if the tiles weren't like cement. Was I was like, what? And he just like was so mad, and he like rushed out and just slammed the door on me and I was like, ugh, like that was kind of rude, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess like something this small, like, I don't know, I just didn't think it was a big deal and like he just perceived it, perceived it as like such a bad situation that, I don't know, I think it's like a personal experience, I was like, ugh, alright, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't want to steer us away too much from all these 